Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Global Capital Markets, moderated by Global Head of Financial and Strategic Investors Group at Goldman Sachs, Allison Mass. Good morning, and welcome everyone to the Global Capital Markets Panel at the 2019 Milken Institute Conference. I'm Allison Mass, Global Head of the Financial and Strategic Investors Group at Goldman Sachs. So what we want to do on this panel is address a broad array of geopolitical and economic topics, and I'm really delighted to be here today and hear thoughts on these issues from a fantastic group of experienced industry leaders. So diving right in, Let's start with the geopolitical environment and its influences on the market. One of the pressing issues of our day is the rise of nationalism and populism. So, Sir Michael, as head of a multi-strat asset management firm based in London, I'd like to start with you. What are the underlying drivers of these related trends, and what are near-term and long-term economic implications for them? Okay, well, again, thank you very much, and it's such a pleasure to be here this morning. Look, my view, very clearly, that this has come from the global financial crisis. Remember, what have we done? Simplistically, but what have we done? We've borrowed money from our children and brought it to us today. That's basically given us the situation where it's increased the Gini coefficient, increased the, the um, amount of... Um, Disp disparity in our society. And the reality is, remember, if you have no capital, why be a capitalist? That's the real problem we've got here. A little bit simplistic, but if you have no capital, why be a capitalist? capitalist? And the logical response to that, the logical response to that is to be a socialist, a nationalist socialist, or a Trotskyist socialist, or, or whatever, or at the very least, to be a governmentalist. So we've got a situation where this has led to populism. Yes, there is a view that the liberal elite has let us down, has let the world down, that there's a disparity, that they will not, the people will not be better off uh, in the next generation than they are today. And we have some really interesting, interesting uh, phenomenon. And the reality is uh, the populist voting share is increasing all over the world. If you pull up slide 13, one, three, uh, you'll see what, that, uh, what, what, is going, what is going on there. Slide 13, if, we, if, if we're waiting for that. But again, let me just talk, talk through that. It is increasing all over the... It is increasing all across the world. And, whether it's, and what, is, what is that giving us the opportunity to do? It, uh, it is prov providing a very interesting <coughs> trading investment opportunity. You need to understand what's happening here. And again, if we go to the, you, and, we, you can, and it goes across the world, it's a global phenomenon. Latin America, Europe, uh, US for that matter. And if you go to slide 14, the next slide uh, on 14, you'll see that it is different country by country. It is a global phenomenon, yet country by country it, it is different. And uh, that is the intriguing thing about that. So if you focus on Europe, which is the next slide, slide 15, there we see a, a significant divergence of populism, whether it's in Italy, where again some really interesting things to trade around, and uh, you know it's it's it's, it's quite a, quite an quite an interesting uh, play there. Obviously, we have Brexit, we have all sorts of other things going on, and uh, the intriguing thing about this rise of populism is it leads to a it leads to a policy dilemma, a, a policy vacuum. And frankly, it is one of the reasons what allows China to be as effective in the world. And I'm not going to talk more about China, but uh, that is a, a ma another massive theme and another massive uh, view that comes out of the populist agenda. Um, so thanks for that. Following on, um, Mark Machen, uh, as head of CPPIB, which is one of the largest pension funds in the world, you set very ambitious targets for investments in emerging markets. Uh, with all of the geopolitical and trade tensions going on today, uh, could you please share your views on China and how those tensions have changed your near-term investing outlook in the country, if at all? Yeah, thank you. So, 
I think the, the, the key on China is, is huge, uh, which we all, we all know. It's massive, uh, massive population. Uh, you know, it's a component of Asia Pacific now. Uh, it, it's, you know, Asia Pacific is now two thirds of the uh, global growth. It's 60% you know, of the global workforce. It's 50% of the population. It's 50% uh, of, of, of fixed investment in the world. Uh, and, uh, you, and then with intra-regional trade is just increasing. 70% of container traffic in the world is in Asia. China is a key component of that. China today is uh, pushing towards uh, you know, its mid-teens percent of GDP. It will be 20% 20, 20 of GDP in the world by 2025. And you know, if things grow in a straight line, it will push towards 25% uh, of GDP by the mid-2030s. So just from pure economic size, massive, so we have to pay attention to it. Second, second thing is markets. Market today, as we know again, the equity market is already the second biggest equity market in the world. Bond market, by some measures, is the second or third largest market in the world. So, uh, you know, government bond market is second largest bond market in the world. So th th these are huge markets. So the question for us is, you know, what do we need to do about that? Well, one of the things that we have the flexibility on is not, we don't need to worry about index inclusion. Uh, so it, it is, I think, a positive thing for, uh, it's a positive thing for the economy and for markets that you know, MSCI uh, has taken the lead in moving towards uh, index inclusion. Other indices are following. Bloomberg indices are now in, including on the, on the fixed income and bond side, which is you know, hugely important for many more investors. So there's much more that's investable now in China, in fact, uh, the vast majority of those markets are now investable for, uh, for a normal investor, although the indices are only including a small weighting today, which will gradually ratchet up over time. I sort of have, from, from, from a fund's point of view, I have sort of mixed views about that because we already had access, and it, it would be uh, nice for us to continue to mature our investments and get, get more scale in those markets before you know, everybody can get access. Uh, you know, we already had QFI, you know, QDII, we had uh, other, other ways of accessing those markers. But I think, you know, so w w what does all this mean and where, where is China going? Um, you know, it's big, it's diversifiable into, and I think increasingly investors are having to look at it. The, the way we look at it is really two simple ways. One is, it's, it's a big market that you can diversify into. And if you look at uh, discount rates, risk premia, they're pretty, uh, there's pretty low correlation with the rest of the world. So it's a big market you can diversify into that is uncorrelated with other markets. And you know, that's something that most investors should, should look at. Second thing is, there's a lot of inefficiencies. You know, a very considerable amount of the equity market is still retail driven, inefficient retail driven. A considerable amount of the bond market is just traded by banks, not really traded. So there's huge amounts of inefficiencies. So there is an opportunity for, for excess alpha over time as well. So from both of those reasons, that's why we're diversifying into that market. We also have the ability to invest in, uh, in private assets as well, and that, that, that's a whole other story I could get into. I think just to touch, um, before, before I finish on China, on the risks. There's lots and lots of risks. I think in the, in the short term, uh, there are uh, two or three major risks, which are uh, inappropriate regulation. So I'd say there is uh, the risk last year, there was a, an excessive and simultaneous clampdown on the shadow banking system and deleveraging the economy. Both great things to do, but doing them at the same time had the unfortunate consequence of really starving the private sector of capital in China. Second thing is the trade tensions. I think markets right now seem to be pricing and almost given that there will be an agreement with the US on, on trade. We all hope there is, but there's more risk to that, certainly uh, you know, in, in the medium term uh, than probably markets are pricing. And if there wasn't a trade deal, then I think, and if tariffs went up to 25%, it would have a profound impact, not just on the China markets, but I think the global economies. Um, and then, then I think there's, uh, there's the risks um, of, uh, you know, of, of tensions with, you know, with other countries you know, around the region as well. The, the other big one is debt. The fact that debt, as Sir Michael just mentioned, globally is 250% of GDP. Similarly in China, it's of that level. And if you look at the local government 
financing vehicles. They have 50 trillion RMB of debt. Uh, plus, there's a bunch of other vehicles that have another 50 trillion of, of commitments on top of that. So that's a huge amount of, uh, of debt and obligations that somehow needs to get paid or restructured or pushed through the MPLs, the banking system. And then finally, I'd say in the long term, two major risks, which are demographics. The workforce has already peaked. The overall population will peak in the next 10 years. Uh, and so there's a big demographic decline, almost on the same curve as Japan. And then finally, uh, there is you know, the political succession uh, process as well, which uh, I think you know, will, will be a big issue. Can I say something on? Thank you. <laughs> Michael, you said you wanted to. I, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to, <laughs> to bump in. I was trying to say it's sort of uh, No, but Mark, Mark has always um, cuts to the chase very, very well. There's a massive opportunity there. But the, the point which I wanted to, do, to add was that this fits very well, very, very well with their geopolitical uh, thrust. And part of that geopolitical thrust is to become a competing reserve currency to the US dollar. And to be a reserve currency, you need to be three things. One, a unit of trade. They're the largest trading nation in the world as we speak. The unit of trade they are. Store of value, we'll see. But I think that, that they've got a good place, chance to be there. But frankly, they need to be investable, which is what Mark has spent uh, the time now talking about. And for it to be investable, it, it does need to be uh, open. So as part of the, the, the move toward being a global reserve currency, those three things are there, but especially the fact that they're opening themselves up uh, to be an investable currency. And the other thing probably is to run a uh, current account deficit. And you, I don't know if people have noticed, but in the last quarter, they've started running the current account deficit. And it's actually quite clever the way it's being, being run. And of course, if you're supplying the uh, RMB to the world, or I guess it's, it sort of looks through the dollar, through the lens of the dollar at the moment, but if you run that, run that situation, you can actually have a, uh, uh, you do actually need to be investable. And I think there's a massive opportunity there, as Marcus uh, has, has outlined. Thank you. Um, let's transition a bit to more of general macro environment around the world, particularly in the US. Um, Mark Atanasio is head of a direct lending platform. Uh, you need to be attuned to the impact of the central banks and the impact they're having on liquidity. So the year's off to a good start. Um, how do you see that progressing throughout the rest of 2019 into 2020 in the US? And where do you think we are in the cycle? So Allison, uh, I'll actually start with, I think, slide nine, just as a backdrop to play off what Sir Michael and Mark said. <clears throat> we have a slide that shows what our investors uh, voted in the last conference, our last investor conference in, uh, in October as to their largest risk, and that would be geopolitical. 50% of our investors were worried about that. Uh, at Crescent, we are exclusively lenders, effectively, and so uh, we're perpetually nervous, and we try to look at things we can control. <clears throat> we can't control geopolitical risks. Number two risk our investors highlighted actually was Donald Trump uh, at 18% of our votes, and uh, we all know we can't control the president. So we focus on number three risk was uh, global liquidity and the uh, impact of the central banks, that we think we can at least measure. And today, it appears, uh, especially after several rate hikes in the United States, but it appears as though uh, the central banks around the world uh, have our backs when it comes to taking risk. Virtually, uh, you know, in Europe, United States, Japan, uh, there's accommodative policies, somewhat executed in different ways, but accommodative policies. And so uh, the environment is going to be such to still try to squeeze whatever's left out of this uh, growth cycle, to squeeze more juice out of the orange, so to speak. Uh, we've been concerned since 2014 at Crescent that uh, the cycle was coming to an end. Here we are in 2019, and we still feel you have at least another year to go. And we have the benefit of looking at uh, flash numbers from private companies, middle market companies, which often give you a better indicator of where things are going globally. Uh, recently, we've done going private transactions not only in the United States, but in Australia and New Zealand. And I can say things are, are pretty good there. And, and in the Eurozone, obviously slower, but with uh, 
with the accommodative policies there may be engineered uh, differently in how they're making incentives to banks to make loans, we, we are still finding growth in niche businesses uh, in Europe, especially in the developed countries in, in Europe for what we do. So uh, measured caution, uh, but I'd say for this year, still growth and still okay. Thank you. Joe, you're also heavily invested and focused uh, in the credit space. Do you agree with Mark's assessment of where we are on the cycle? Um, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question, and I think one of the ones that, that uh, we as you know, investors all collectively have to be thinking about. Um, on you know, uh, slide 32, I don't know if we can put that up, the, uh, you know, one of the things, I, I chair our risk committee, and uh, this is something that you know, we, we use and I'd like to share with, 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 with you all as, as a way to put things in perspective and really try to take the emotion out of where we are from a kind of long-term value perspective. And I think maybe to answer the question of where we are, you kind of look at maybe where we were and then where we're going. Uh, in, in, in the peak of 2018, for example, if you looked at equity markets, and let's use the equity market in the U.S. equity market as a broad measure, PEs were close to the 90th percentile. And then if you look at credit markets, let's use high yield in, in the U.S., also around the 90th percentile in peak of 2018. Um, and what that informed us when we were thinking about it from, from a top-down perspective was that valuation was actually quite stretched. Um, and then turn the clock forward to end of December, and things had changed dramatically. Growth, growth rates had slowed. But if you had to, actually looked at the rate of change of valuation versus the rate of change of growth, it was actually maybe too far too much. Um, that was our perspective. And I think if you looked at where PEs were, they were in the low 30s and also in terms of where high yield spreads are. So now, uh, today, we're actually in the 74th percentile, give or take, in the US equity markets from a PE perspective. And then in, in credit spreads, actually we haven't snapped back that far. So we have had a big recovery, but maybe putting it in perspective over long periods of time, we're not necessarily at the peaks that we were in 2018. Okay, so that's one way to look at things. But I think from our perspective, the, you know, the maybe even more interesting question is, what do you do? Um, and that's kind of where I think we, we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about from a bottom-up perspective. And page <coughs> slide 33 is actually, uh, you know, I think where we've, we've tried to take our focus, which is to focus more on event-driven, you know, opportunities, idiosyncratic situations globally. And, um, you know, default rates, have been low, and Mark, Mark kind of made the point, it hasn't been a really high default rate environment, yet what we've seen is under the surface, there's actually been a lot of sort of disruption, right, a lot amongst a lot of industries, retail, energy. Um, we found uh, great investments globally. For example, OI in Brazil was the largest Brazilian uh, default in, in, in their history. Uh, we led that restructuring. <laughs> Um, we found some great investments from, from a distress perspective in financials in Europe. Uh, in, in, in North America, Puerto Rico has been an, a tremendous opportunity. 21 different boxes to invest in, 70 billion worth of debt, completely messed up. In fact, if you thought back to what my uh, sort of overview was from that, mac that uh, perspective of, of where we were in December, the market had gotten very dislocated, and in fact, we were looking at, at Puerto Rico, and that situation, which was very, very event-driven and was on a process, sold off with the rest of the market, even though its situation was actually improving. It gave us an opportunity to invest more. So, um, you know, I think from our perspective, we try to find things that are going to be a little bit less tied to some of the uh, kind of these big macro risk-on, risk-off moves to take advantage of, uh, you know, opportunities that from a bottom-up perspective we can make money on. Okay, Joe, I want to stay with you for a minute. Uh, the loan market has doubled in size since 2007 mm. and has become a focal point for regulation. So what are your concerns for the market and what's different about loans this time versus the previous cycle? Yeah, so that one's a great topic. It's, it's caught you know, sort of headlines. It's, in fact, it's caught the, Fed, the Federal Reserve's attention. Um, slide 34, if I, if I might kind of just hit you with a few stats there. We've been talking about this for a few years. The rating agencies have, have caught on as well. Um, really three areas of concern broadly when you take a, a macro look at, 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 at leveraged loans. 
Um, recovery rates from where they were before look different. So 20 years ago, you had 40% subordination. You look like you have 20% subordination now. That means broadly you should expect the same cycle, lower recovery rates. Uh, Cov lights have been talked about a lot. So in 2007, there was about 17% worth of Cov lights in the leverage loan market. They're 78% now. So just from a, from a you know, lender and, and debtor perspective, the conversation's different. And then from a leverage perspective, you're also seeing you know, leverage creep into the system like we had in 2007. So we're at 4.4 multiple on senior secured debt and versus 3.6. So that, that's a bad equation you know, for where we are in, in leveraged loans. Um, but if you turn to the next slide, page 35, um, some of this has already been being priced in, right? So this isn't sneaking up on the market perfectly. Um, if you look at where loans are pricing relative to bonds, they used to price materially tighter than bonds. And sometime after the financial crisis, if you actually look at the, at the relative spreads, they've actually come in and you're now seeing, you know, what might, be, what might seem unusual on the, on the top from the surface, that loans actually are pricing around the same spreads as bonds. Now, some of this is because loans are floaters and there's different demand for floaters in, in a very, very low interest rate environment that we're in today. Uh, some of it's also composition, there's been some changes, but I think some of it's also some recognition and change in, in, the, in the credit risk. But I think that the takeaway I, I have from, from this and, and from, an, from a manager's perspective is the expectation going forward is we're gonna have more volatility. And I think to invest in loans, you know, using the same sort of passive approaches or counting on senior secured aspect of bank loans isn't gonna work out the same. And credit, you know, sort of active management is gonna be the, what really differentiates uh, you know, the ability to really take advantage of this asset class. Thanks. We have a lot of topics to get to, and I want to talk about market structure next. But before we do, Elif, um, in our conversations about China, um, I'd love to get your perspective from a capital markets point of view about the gradual opening of the markets. And if you can give us a brief perspective on what you're seeing. So we've seen a gradual opening of Chinese uh, financial markets over the last uh, two to three years, um, as led by the Chinese government and PBOC. A couple examples include um, restrictions that are lifted in foreign ownership of securities companies. We are now able to own 51%, as well as such restrictions in asset management and life insurance companies. Those restrictions will be totally abolished over the next three years. Similar opening up in the automotive sector, where alternative um, energy providers, the electric cars now, the foreigners could own 100%, and the same thing is going to be applied to commercial um, uh, auto manufacturers as well as passengers over the next couple of years. Something similar in oil and gas, wherein um, downstream fuel distribution, foreign ownership has been lifted. Also from a stock market perspective, you'll recall a couple years ago, there's been the Shanghai Hong Kong um, Stock Exchange that has been um, expanded to Bond Exchange, Bond Connect, as well as Shenzhen Hong Kong. And this year, China has announced intentions to connect uh, Shanghai to London and Shanghai to Deutsche Börse, so clearly a lot of intention. But to put, it all, put all of this in context, foreign ownership of Chinese A shares is 2.6%. This compares with 39% in Korea, 30% in Japan, 21% in the US, and 20% in India. So still room for, for growth. That's great. Anyone else want to weigh in on the opening of markets in China before we switch to the next topic? Any other perspectives? Okay. So now moving to market structure, we've seen a migration of, of capital from public markets to private markets over the last 20 years. If you can put up slide 43, please, for a minute. Um, the, the left hand of the chart, when it goes up, uh, you'll see shows the absolute number of listed U.S. companies has decreased over the last two decades. By the end of 2015, you see the number stands at half of the 1997 count. We also see the percentage of US taxpayers participating in the stock market drop off over the last 20 years. So Mark Machen, I wanna ask you, uh, you allocate capital across both public markets and private markets. Is that shift mirrored in your own capital allocation? And if so, what's the rationale for that shift? Yes, I, so 
So if you, if you look at our assets, if you, if you just look at level two, level three assets together would be about 65% of our portfolio, level, level, level three about 50% of the portfolio. So there's one, one way of looking at how much private we have in the portfolio. And I think probably a lot of our peers are quite, are quite similar. There's been a, an inexorable rise of the amount of private capital that, uh, that, that we've all invested in. And I'm, that's broadly, so that's across private equity, that's across infrastructure, that's across private credit, real estate, uh, so real assets and, and, and private, uh, other private capital. Now, we like, um, you know, we like the different um, diversification potential of, the, of these different types of uh, assets, but private equity is very similar to public equity. And you know, as we look through it, at, you know, so underlying equity, um, the... Uh, you know, we think that uh, while valuations got very stretched uh, in private equity compared to where they used to be, uh, there's still, when we look at you know, our sort of long-term return expectations and what we see in the market today in private equity, there's still, you know, some, there's still some, uh, some opportunities there uh, in the US and Europe and, and in Asia. So it's, it's an area that we will likely continue to invest in, I'd say on the other real assets, uh, areas on real estate and infrastructure, they're pretty highly competed, and there's really not much juice left in those markets at the moment uh, for, uh, you know, for, for us. So it's something that you know, we're, we're struggling to find good opportunities. So I'd say you know, we're quite happy, and one of the reasons why we're quite happy with this is because of uh, we, we have very, very dependable money. It's very long-term money. It can weather the illiquidity in, in a downturn, and we have a big liquidity buffer in a downturn, which I'll come back to. Second point I'll make, just on the, you know, this sort of alarm about the fall in the number of public companies. You know, we certainly want to see good functioning public markets, but I think it's a little bit overdone just to look at the number of those companies in the US market. For example, that's just looking at the US. If you look at the world, going back to China again, China had no listed companies 40 years ago, and now has three and a half, four thousand listed companies. Same in many other markets around the world. So when you look at the number of listed companies in the world, it's gone up dramatically in the last 40 years. So yes, it's gone down in the US, but it's gone up dramatically in the, in, overall. Second, you look at the, the amount of capital that you can invest in versus GDP. And the US is now at almost record high, 150% of GDP. So as a, as a percent of GDP, it's pretty high. Um, third thing is if you look at it relative to the dry powder and private equity. Dry powder and private equity is you know, sort of 1.7 trillion or so. But you know, global, uh, you know, global public markets, 80 trillion. And if you just look in the US, there's you know, two companies are valued more than all of the dry powder of private equity. And, so, and, and then I'd say the final thing I'd say on this point is that you know, back in the day when a lot of small companies were going public very, very early, arguably a lot of those companies were too early for prime time, too early for public market. The fact there's been more growth in private capital to nurture these companies for more years before they actually go to become public, not necessarily a bad thing. So I think it's a little overplayed to get just alarmed by that one statistic and that declining graph. F final thing I'll say on this topic um, on the rise of private is I think people like us need to be super, super careful of the next downturn. Because when the next downturn happens, when, when the market drops a lot, we're going to be, we're going to have all sorts of problems in the private assets. They're all going to be stretched. They're all going to need more capital. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to need liquidity for obligations. And I think Peers, you know, I think pension funds and sovereign funds and endowments around the world need to be super careful to not lean in too much on the private side and not to rely on the fact that the public stuff will be liquid when you come to sell it. Because when you're trying to sell that stuff, everybody else will be trying to sell it as well to fund their obligations. There's not much inventory in many of these asset classes, as we know. We saw the behavior in the gapping in December in a number of these, uh, number of these markets. And I think you're going to find that you know, risk models could blow out very quickly on the public side and trigger more, uh, more events. So I think people need to be super careful and robust and massive liquidity on the public side and, and expect there to be a lot more gapping when they come to sell stuff to fund all the problems they have on the private side. So I'll leave it there. No, it's very balanced perspective. Um, Elif, on the public to private side, you've noticed that this shift is an overlooked element of the focus on ESG. So what do you think of the long-term implications of that shift 
in the global society. So private capital markets are a very important part of the global capital flow. Today, as much primary capital is raised in privates as in public capital markets, both especially in the US and in Asia Pacific. And there are some socioeconomic and ESG considerations that we think um, need to be thought of. Firstly, there is the concept of wealth distribution. Public capital markets, public equity markets, are an equitable and democratic, democratic way of wealth creation. Through pension funds, through insurance schemes, through retail investors and ETFs, you have large parts of the population that can participate in public markets. So far in private capital markets, participation has been a little bit more narrow. You've had the venture capital firms, financial sponsors, and LPs. So the wealth distribution and contribution inclusion is one important characteristic. The second one is governance. Public capital markets have proven themselves in terms of disclosure, accountability, and oversight, which are, again, important social responsibilities of, uh, pro of capital. I think private capital markets are nascent and they are yet to prove themselves when it comes to the governance elements. And the third, potentially uh, most important aspect is sustainability. In the 1990s, on average, venture capital-backed private firms stayed private for five years. Since 2010, they are staying private for nine years, which means a lot of the growth and the returns in these companies are taking place when they are private. And potentially growth is a little bit less after they mature and become public. When you think of the sustainability of the world at large and you think of a world of self-funded retirement, I do think we have to think of return implications, long-term return implications of public capital markets in the rise of privates. Thanks. Another big shift um, in the public equity markets is, in particular, the move from active to passive management, which has largely been characterized by short but dramatic spikes of volatility. So, Michael, it would be great if you could talk about the implications of the rise of quantitative investment strategies and passive investment strategies, like ETFs. Uh, certainly. If, if you if call up slide 45, slide 45, uh, again, you'll see that uh, this is a much bigger uh, trend that we've, uh, we've seen for a long while. Uh, the, the reality is what's, what this has meant is that the market, if you're trading it, is actually overwhelmed by the, uh, by, by the passives in, in, on a, on a longer-term basis. Because what happens on the first day or so of uh, bad news, the, the, uh, the active uh, guys will, will sell, sell out, it'll push the price down, and then a lot of the passive, which is again, uh, and remember, machines have no fear. They don't have anything aside from going, going backwards. They have no valuation per se. The only thing they're looking at is uh, trends, and tre trends to the mean, whether it's trend to volatility, trend to price, trend to, trend to momentum. They will actually drive it back. So again, it's one of the frustrating things if you are running an active um, trading strategy, where that is. So what, the, what that does mean, if you are seeing a valuation, it'll actually change. Uh, Pretty, pretty darn quickly. And it goes back to the point which was made earlier. These passives have done things like they've distorted the, the, uh, the, the, the bond market to valuation versus the loans. I mean, there's no reason why loans should be trading through, um, uh, say again, why a bond should be trading, uh, a yield should be trading through a loan yield. The, 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 the driver of that is the fact that there's a massive amount of passive money going in there that's not looking at value. And uh, that's one of the things that's, uh, that's there. But what is interesting is a lot of these ETFs, a number of them have driven off ESG. Again, that does, I think, drive uh, valuations perhaps for the good in terms of making sure that uh, good companies with good ESG have got, uh, got, uh, got uh, tighter valuations than, uh, uh, than they are. So it's not, not, all, not, not, not necessarily all bad, but th there's no question that the machine will, will, will have no, no, no fear, and it basically means that it'll actually push... Uh, push things to, to different levels. And it is an interesting market to trade in, frankly. I, I've been trading since uh, 1982, and uh, it is different now. You can actually see the algos uh, pushing against you if you're trying to execute a trade. And uh, frankly, it's one of the reasons why I can imagine uh, people are very happy to, to live in a, in a lower volatility uh, basis of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a private world without having to worry about uh, on a, the, 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 val the vol volatility that comes out of the, uh, out of the ETF. 
So Joe and Mark, um, are you seeing a rise also in the passive investment strategies in the credit markets? I think there's a rise from Crescent's perspective. And again, we're looking through a little different lens that a lot of folks are here. We have two thirds of our business is making private credit investments. And so a lot of what you see in terms of excesses in the market or, or challenges or things that we can, as I alluded to earlier, control. Uh, you see some larger public bond managers from our vantage point using ETFs to add assets when they can't otherwise add assets. For our clients, you know, I talked to one of our high yield portfolio managers who every week will either speak to an existing client or a prospective client. No one has really broached with us why would you invest with Crescent or with an active manager versus a passive manager? And I think one of the reasons is that on the, on the passive side, so far, you still can't beat the benchmarks the way you can with equities. So I think only, uh, if I, CNBC did a study last year, and I think 36% of active equity managers were able to beat a passive benchmark, whereas in uh, intermediate bond managers, it's 70%. I've seen for high yield bond managers, 80% of us beat passive indexes. So there's really not an advantage yet to going passive. The other, I think, technical point is that uh, there's one QSIP for an equity, and for a particular uh, company, there'll be several different bond QSIPs. And so one of the benefits an active manager has is to pick the proper a tranche of security to invest in and not, you know, you, you've got, in many cases, five or six choices of, of loans to invest in or, or bonds in a particular company. And the, the trick is to pick the right one. So in the risk environment that uh, Joe described, we are now moving more senior and, and shorter in duration. Equities, it's a binary choice. You pick the, the stock or you don't. So. Uh, for, for now, the ability to control, uh, is, credit's a good place to be to control your, your destiny uh, relative to some of the challenges you see. And for right now, we're not worried about ETFs. They do spike volatility, and that, some of the things, you're, Joe, you're talking about that you take advantage of, and we try to take advantage of. The ETFs create uh, more volatility in the markets, and that's, for patient investors, that's opportunity. Yeah. Can, can I just... Joe. Uh, I'm sorry. Good. I would. I mean, I, I just sort of maybe to compliment Mark and and, and Sir Michael, you know, the, the 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 sort of passive rise is great. I mean, because it it does a few things. One is, you know, I mean, if if we can't add value by finding other things to do that the passive is doing, then then I think that that's pretty sad. So I I hope we can we can we can. Um, it does create great opportunities a for hedging. So I mean, in you know, uh, September you know, so September two thousand. 18, I think, you know, HYG was one of our largest shorts um, in, our, in our book. It spreads were at 305. Thank, thank, thank you, ETFs. That was great. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, there also, when you look at, I can give you lots of markets that have not yet been, you know, passivized or has, haven't been active. And that creates, that's where we go. So we're going to go to where the opportunity exists. It's going to be, you know, things like, they're going to be, you know, sort of out of that that sort of world, and that's where the the relative value, and that we're going to earn, you know, sort of better returns um, and be able to to to, to capture value. Um, emerging markets, uh, you know, distressed um, structured products. Um, we see this all over the all over the place. So, um, you know, for for at least now, and maybe for quite some time, um, this isn't a bad thing to us. It's actually a good thing. Uh, it's creating, I think, more more fragmentation. It's creating you know, um, places for us to be able to kind of capture relative value and quite often be able to hedge better than we maybe could have even 10 years ago. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the, the, these, these um, pa passives do not take away our ability. In fact, as you, you said, Sajra, they, they add to our ability to take idiosyncratic risk and uh, potentially hedge that risk as well, which is the exciting piece about it. And again, as a recipient of uh, funds to manage from uh, sovereign wealth funds all the way through to uh, pension funds, to be, frankly, to, in, to individuals, there is a barbelling going on. People will seek their, uh, their, 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 uh, their beta at a very, very small return, and yet uh, we will be, we'll be paid to do what we, uh, what we do hopefully well uh, at, at, a, at a better rate. And I think that's, uh, that's a healthy part of the market, I think. Exactly. So yeah. I want to pivot a little bit more towards general technology and the disruption we're seeing in market structure. 
Much of it has been focused on the buy side. So Elif, um, what roles do you think technology and data analytics have to play on the sell side, both in the context of relationships and in service and capital markets? Thank you, Alison. A couple of points come to mind. Um, first of all is cost. As the buy side has moved to more ETFs and more passive, we need to replicate that. So we need, we're using robots, we're using robots, pro robotic process automation, and other measures to be able to offer cost-effective service to our clients. So cost is an important part of it. The second part is speed. In 2000, it took 25 seconds to execute a trade. Today, we execute a million trades in a nanosecond, in the blink of an eye. So our pipes need to be faster, a lot of investment going into speed of delivery. Thirdly is the use of data analytics and AI to serve our clients better on the sell side, to use the relationships and the trust in the relationships with data. So we're working on projects like Demand Predictor. Within the context of equity capital markets, we have a model that predicts who will be who will show the best demand, highest demand in an equity offering, whether it's an IPO or a follow-on. Or we're working on things like day finder. Can you assign a temperature rating for any given day to decide whether it's a good day to launch a deal? Other things, can you predict or forecast using data how a stock will perform after the IPO depending on where you price it versus the demand book or the composition of the allocation. So there is a lot that's going on in data science and machine learning that we can use to augment our relationships and move from a relationship only to a relationship with data uh, type of model. Also, something like the uberization of financial services is happening, in our opinion, which is creating of platforms. Bank of America is a founding member of an industry-led consortium that uses technology to improve communication on new issues. The idea is, can we have a seamless issue, issuer to investor new issue experience? We've started this with investment grade, but potentially the applications are across asset classes. So it's the concept of almost investment banking as a service. So technology is very much affecting many matrix on the sell side. I was going to ask you if today is a good day to launch a deal. <laughs> <coughs> yes. <laughs> you heard it here. Um, so technology is also having a disruptive impact on investment, investing, particularly for long duration investors. And Mark Machen, you probably have the longest term investment horizon of any of the panelists. And I know you've thought at CPPIB about a greater focus on thematic investing, particularly around mega trends. So how do you think about long-term investing in an environment that's ripe for disruption? Yeah, so I think that there's, uh, there's offense and defense on this. So I think everybody here recognizes the increased pace of uh, the acceleration of disruption. And so long long has gone the time where we could invest in a piece of infrastructure, think we're going to hold it for 50, 60, 70 years, and nothing's going to happen in the environment to it. So whether it's, that's electricity transmission or you know, gas transmission or, or even a toll road, you, you know th these things, uh, there's going to be technological change that is going to change, uh, change the... Uh, the outlook for these assets over time, and it could happen much more quickly than we had anticipated. So we, we need to understand these trends, and we, so we're playing defense and trying to figure out what these trends are, how they're going to impact all this stuff that we're holding in our portfolio in the longer term. And then there's the offense of trying to find interesting opportunities in these areas to invest in. So we established a group a few years ago called Thematic Investing to try and exploit these long-term themes. These are not secret themes. These are not themes that you know, other people haven't seen, but they're ones that it requires a fairly long-term hold to actually exploit the value in them and some fairly detailed an analysis to get down to find where the value is at any particular moment. So, for example, just the, the, the trend of uh, data, data analytics and data, data to value, um, automobility, uh, the move to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, uh, energy disruption, how that's changing. Demographics, uh, the aging baby boomers, uh, and then the, the power of the consumer in middle class and in, in emerging markets. 
And then the environmental and climate, climate change shift, which I'll, I'll come back on that one. I just, you know, a couple of highlights on, for example, automobility. You know, we look at our toll roads, we look at what might happen with autonomous vehicles, uh, the positives, the negatives with autonomous vehicles. Uh, and we want to understand the uptake of these vehicles. We actually are more optimistic, the market and most people, on the uptake of autonomous vehicles. We think it's going to happen faster than most consultants and, and commentators think. Uh, we've invested in a number of the private autonomous vehicle companies uh, like Aurora, like Zoox, uh, and we're also investing in some of the charging companies and some of the sensor companies like Aptif to, to understand this environment. And so I think probably net is probably a slight positive for toll roads in the longer term, and then you, ultimately you'll be able to compress more cars, be more efficient transport over these toll roads. But something we've got to watch uh, very carefully what that will do. It's clearly a negative for probably a negative for your parking, depending on where your parking is, because uh, your car will be able to go off and park somewhere else, but you're probably still going to need your car in some type of vicinity. So I think there's quite micro in parking as well. Um, just on, on the environmental and the ESG stuff, I might yeah. just touch on that for a second, because it's something that we focused on. There's obviously a huge amount of uh, effort around the world to push companies and you know, to, to have better environmental, social, and governance responsibilities, something we've been doing for many years, focused on a whole number of areas. Investing in it and actually creating alpha from it, very, very difficult. Um, and so it, it's something that I think most ESG, almost no ESG fund actually creates any alpha. Uh, the, I think some of the ESG stats are, you know, are just so noisy, it's, it's, they're, they're, it's almost useless to use. You'll have one provider that will have Tesla at the top of the ESG stats and one that will have Tesla right under the bottom of the ESG stats, depending on you know, you know, a whole range of you know, governance and fuel and efficiency. And, uh, so it, 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 they're just virtually, I wouldn't say useless, but they're, they're virtually useless today at the stage they're at right now. So you have to build your own database, proprietary database, figure out you know, what really matters for each company, each sector. Uh, and that's, that's laborious, takes a lot of work to actually use that data uh, effectively, but it's something that we, we think is important for long-term holds. One particular area we focused on is, uh, is gender diversity on boards, which we think is uh, you know, an important issue. I know I'm drifting off technology here, but I think ge gender diversity on, on boards is something we, we've done a huge amount of proprietary research on. Uh, we've done meta-analysis of 100 external studies, we've done our own study of 3,800 securities around the world, and we think there is a, a positive correlation uh, between gender diversity on boards and long-term value creation on boards, so it's something that we've become more active on pushing in with, with our companies, so that, that's another theme. Could, could I just uh, add something? That with Mark, it's, it's interesting, Mark comes up with Tesla. We, we obviously use um, ESG in our process as well. The, the weird one is Tesla. You're quite right, Mark. It's either at the top or the bottom. Mm. Very, very interesting. And I think it's got everything to do with how disruptive uh, that company is. Um, notwithstanding the the G does sometimes make me my eyebrows raise, but that's another story, right? But the but the but the point is that that is such an incredibly innovative and and uh, and, dis and uh, disruptive company. And look, there is a major theme here going on. And if I might call up uh, slide 12, but as I go as we're calling up slide 12. We are in a disruptive world, and Mark is right at the heart of it. And he, his, his investment horizon is, is very, very exciting. The, the interesting thing about this is that you think about the, the Marxist view of the world, labor, capital, land. We now have data as the fourth tool of production. Labor and technology as the fourth tool of production. And that is in a world where we've got a massive market volatility around politics. And Mark's point is you, you invest in a toll road for 50 years, and let me tell you, 30 years on, they don't like you anymore? Goodbye. You'll take it. I can, I can give you some real terrible examples. The only people who can really take value from you and destroy you are government. As somebody said the other day, they have nuclear weapons, and they definitely have bigger weapons than I do. And, you know, the reality is that that is a, a big deal. So it's a really exciting world, which is why you can't forget about the fact that we've got data, and, uh, and geopolitics is a, is a big deal. But that said, I am really very, uh, very, very, um, co very constructive about the markets going forward, especially for the next five years. I'm not, I'm not sure about the next 50, but definitely for the next five. Um, before we leave the ESG topic, 
Uh, Mark, you mentioned that you have a good example of how you use ESG principles to make better credit judgments. So <clears throat> would you share that with us? Yeah, I mentioned to Allison last night at the uh, Goldman cocktail party, who's was nice enough to be invited to, that uh, besides macro uh, standpoints for ESG looking forward many years in disruptive uh, technologies and industries, that we're finding uh, as an early adopter of ESG is, and using those tenets as part of our credit process, it's been very instructive to keep us, uh, well, allow us to make some very sound investments as you look at sustainable companies and keep us out of difficult investments that in fact in one case in the UK went to administration where an ESG principle uh, kicked us out or prevented us from making the investment and, and we were saved. So interestingly, for example, uh, we looked at a supply chain in the United States in an herbal extract company uh, where the workers were getting bitten by rattlesnakes, uh, the, the ecosystem was being disrupted from the uh, plants that were being uh, harvested. We didn't make that investment. We did, interestingly, make a, a supply, uh, we diligenced a supply chain in China for pet food that was getting sold in the United Kingdom, and that uh, held up, and that investment's performed very well. And, and so we found that even on the ground, uh, or day-to-day, -day, I should say, using ESG principles as part of our credit process has been uh, very fruitful. So we've covered a lot of ground on the current state of the markets. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists uh, short answers, uh, three short answer questions. Um, so the first question, and we'll start with you, Joe. Um, what is the biggest risk to the health of the global economy and capital markets right now? in your view? Short answer. Short answer. Short answer is, I think, um, we're watching from a macro top-down perspective, I think probably the US dollar, which is up about 9% in the last year. Oil's you know, sort of getting into the mid-70s, so you know, things that will change this Goldilocks environment where you have, um, you know, we're watching this. It's, it's a race between the central banks and slower growth. The central banks right now are winning, and uh, Things that will change that will, could change the, the uh, macro environment. Um, but right now, the bottom up looks OK. OK. Mark. Uh, isolationism in all of its forms. OK, that was a great short answer and very <laughs> short. OK, Michael. Uh, e energy. Look, energy, oil is about 3 3.5% three of global GDP. The other energy pieces are about 2%. That price change is, will actually change the uh, the world, but if you really want to know what keeps me awake at night is the uh, pandemic issue. That'll destroy the world. Uh, if you look at what happened in, uh, when SARS hit, there, was a, a, and that was, uh, there were only 30, what, 30, 37 people died. Uh, the, the, the reality is that that knocked the global GDP down by about um, 3 to 4% pretty much overnight. So that's, that's something that'll actually take us, uh, take us to, the, to, to the cleaners. Okay. Elif? Low interest rates, it allows for mispricing of risk. Mark? So I'd like to point to slide six. I don't know if we have an ability to put that up. I don't know. Up. Are we allowed short answers have but, slides? Uh, okay. Well, it, it's, a, it's a demonstration of the growth of the stock market in the United States and the wage growth. And you see a huge outperformance for how stocks have grown and wages have stayed relatively flat while growing. So the good news is that keeps inflation down. The bad news is it's created all kinds of divides in this country that may be irreparable if they're not uh, changed soon. And uh, maybe, again, this is a US-centric view, but is previously the, the global leader of the free world, uh, that we can't even manage uh, to agree in our own country on how to run things, I think uh, portends problems for the future uh, from a social standpoint. Can I tell you something? There's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a U.S. citizen here, but it's interesting your imagination. The fact that the U.S. dollar, if you look at the global purchasing power parity, is 125 trillion. It's in U.S. dollars, it's 80 trillion. A dollar in the U.S. buys a dollar. A dollar outside the U.S. buys a dollar fifty. I'm not surprised that we, you've got those disparities inside the U.S. I mean, but the good news is for the U.S. is it's somewhat uh, self, uh, self, self. Um, uh, contained, but I mean the, the reality is that uh, that Gini coefficient is a, is a big deal, which is I think what, what's being talked to. But I, the macro reason why that's happening it doesn't surprise me one iota. Okay, second short answer question. 
Joe. Uh, what will be the best performing asset class a year from now when we're sitting here? So I would think the um, you know, best way to answer that is based on how we're positioned in our, in our flagship fund. You know, our biggest allocation is in distrust. Okay, seeing as I was so short last time, I will digress for a minute. I, okay. I, I was going to say that this, these one-word answers reminds me of the uh, anecdote of when Boris Yeltsin was once asked to comment on the state of the Russian economy, and he was normally typically incredibly verbose. So they said, please, President Yeltsin, just give me one-word answer. So he said, good. And then, <laughs> then he was asked, well, That's could you expand on that a little? And he said, not good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. So, um, one word answer. I'm also going to digress because we're a long-term investor. I'm going to give a long-term view, ten-year view, uh, and I think uh, I think private private equity is probably going to be the best performer over the next five to ten years. Okay, Michael. Uh, credit, credit in the short in the short term, especially structured credit over over two two to three year cycle. Okay, Elif. Um, given the low interest rates, equities. I think public equities. Public equities in general, but okay. public as well. Mark? There's almost a trillion dollars of triple B minus bonds that could get downgraded and fall into you know, opportunistic distress trading categories, and that's what we're looking at. Okay. So last question. We, we all read a lot. Let's say I woke up in 2019, had no idea what was going on in the world. What piece of literature could I read that best explains the current environment? Joe? Hands down, because I follow it obsessively, is Twitter. Twitter, okay. <laughs> historical literature as well. It was the interpretation. I love Twitter, but historical literature, wait, waiting for Godot, waiting for the rise of inflation. Okay. Samuel Beckett, Beckett has a lot to answer for. That's a terribly <laughs> boring play, waiting for Godot. But, uh, but, but <laughs> le leaving that aside, uh, Henry Kissinger's book on world order, that is uh, which he published in 2014. I think that one where he talks about the change in the Westphalian order, that is a really book which is really worth reading. Henry Kissinger is really good off the charts. He's great. Okay. Elif? Um, I'll answer in terms of a book. Um, it's AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Li, and I think we're very lucky to have him here because he not only talks about the importance of AI and data, but also the differences of approaches of China and, and the U.S. to that topic. Okay. And Mark? I like a book, Sapiens, it's a history of humankind. It gives you a perspective on how we all think and behave, but I would defer looking forward to an AI book on <laughs> learning how we all behave. Okay, great. Well, can everyone please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. I love your insight. God, you're good.